does he go from the state of being saved now to the state of being unsaved? And this new gospel now goes out in waves, so to speak, although it wouldn't be circular, you know, kind of up to Antioch and then down to Alexandria and up, you know. Uh, and then ultimately, when this wave crest hits Rome, now that person can hear about the saving work of Christ and he can receive Christ and now he's saved. So he, what, he went from saved to unsaved back to saved. Or the, the case I brought up last time was he dies in 33 AD in June and the word hasn't reached Rome yet. So he, would, he was going to make it and then Jesus came and that unsaved him. And that, you know, I, I tell the story because it's an um, argument ad absurdum uh, idea that this notion of the gospel has to go out and reach when the new covenant came in to change the rules doesn't seem on the face of it to be intuitively plausible. So if that's not the case, then what do what we say is, well, within the rings, salvation is done one way. Outside the rings, salvation is done another way. Now, that's possible. It's possible that that's the case. If there's a covenant and then a new covenant, it's possible that that's the case. But we want to ask ourselves, like, as people who are trying to be familiar with the mind and heart of God, does that make good sense to you? Does it sound like God is like, okay, here's the rules. Ah, not those rules. Now I'm going to change the game entirely. Here's these rules. And technically would have done this three times. Nope, nope, not that anymore. Now here's the last way I'm going to do it. It seems more plausible to us that God's um, plan, procedure, method, requirement, whatever, has actually been constant through all history. God hasn't changed what it takes to, to, to be living in the kingdom, so to speak, <coughs> that that's been constant throughout. And so what that requires, if we like that intuition, is a systematic theology that says the way that one is saved, and what I mean by the, the way, is the, the way that one is saved from Adam through the end of mankind, or through the end of this earth, heaven and earth, is the same. It it may be that we didn't know all of the mechanism up until some point. It may be that some people die without ever knowing all the mechanism. It's probably the case, right, that we all in this room will die without understanding all of what God, who God is and what he did. It's very probable. How much knowledge is required and how much response is required and what response is required. So I won't rehash it because we went over it last time, but you'll remember I pointed us to Romans and said, except Jesus because this, because uh, uh, here, um, who, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So in that sense, to his question, is the notitia situationally dependent? My answer is going to be, I uh, would like to just say yes and end it, but let me instead pose a question back. If it's not situationally dependent, do you believe that any two people in the world have exactly the same knowledge of God and of his good news in order to accept it? That was probably a convoluted way to ask the question, but you see what I'm saying. You come from a certain background and understanding. I come from a different background and understanding. When someone says God to you, that has a certain connotation. When somebody says God to me, that has a connotation. If I don't understand God perfectly, does that mean that on calling on the name of the Lord, if I don't have exactly the full understanding of his identity down, can I not call on the name of the Lord? Now, obviously, if it's the case, I think fairly obviously, if it's the case that you have to have it exactly right, nobody makes it because nobody understands God perfectly except God. We've got news, I mean, uh, um, um, scripture to support that one. Like, no one has searched the mind of God but the spirit of God kind of idea. In the same way that nobody knows your mind like you, like you or your spirit knows your mind. So... Um, if it's, if it's the case that you don't have to know him perfectly, what's the standard? 87.3%? 19%? 42 uh, The answer, as Douglas Adams said, is 42%. Just kidding. Uh, so is it situationally dependent? I would say yes. Uh, to my mind, every offer of salvation and every acceptance of salvation is in some ways so unique that it's a one-for-one one from God to you. By the same token, you can generalize it and say, but in general, what happened was that God set up these rules. He said, this is the standard. We've collectively failed to meet the standard. He provides his son as a way out. And so, yes, we can generalize it. But if you say specifically, how do you hear it? And, what, and you hear this, if you believe, put any credence in the stories of how people come to be saved. S stories like this, yourself, you heard it preached in some church. You came forward, maybe, right? 
stories that have been told in this church. Missionary out to um, Israel, Pal- uh, uh, Israeli, um, longtime Israeli Jew who fought in you know, all kinds of Israeli wars, uh, out with two uh, young evangelical Christian ladies on whom she, of whom, with whom she was not terribly impressed as to their you know, theological you know, depth or whatever else. And they said, will you just pray with us? They were literally in a boat on the Sea of Galilee, according to this, this story that was told. Um, and this older Jewish lady hears them saying, um, you know, just praying that, they, that this woman will meet Jesus. And she's bored with the praying thing like anybody who hasn't prayed for a while. And so she opens her eyes and looks up. And there's the two girls sitting there and there's a dude sitting in the boat with them. And she was like, it was Jesus. I know I was sitting right across from Jesus. Dressed in Palestinian garb, interestingly. Uh, and this lady tells us, this Jewish lady with no motivation to support a couple of evangelical Christians. By the way, we're not terribly welcome in, in Israel. You're welcome in Israel if you're doing tourism. You're not as welcome in Israel if you're trying to convert Jews to Christianity. Uh, they're, not, they're not exactly stoked with that idea. Nor are they stoked with highly orthodox or Hasidic recruiting uh, as well. But at the end of the day, if, that's, if a story like that is true, it would be some sort of evidence of here's a very personalized approach to somebody. And we see that from, with Jesus. Jesus, some places, is like, come follow me. Drop your nets and follow me. Sometimes he's like, go sell everything you've got, give it to the poor, and follow me. Sometimes he's like, the person's like, I want to follow you. Don't follow me. Go back and tell your people. Wait, which one is it? Is there a standard procedure or is there not? The standard procedure is go to God, listen to what he has to say, and do it. <laughs> and let the standard in there. That's probably more answer to that than, than we needed, but go ahead. Or wanted. Required, yes. Yes. And you know, there's people that, you know, come to Jesus in lots of different ways, right? And so if it was all one to one, it would, you know, you'd cut out all the other people who who are carpenters or who are scientists, you know, who come to the Lord in different ways. No, that's a very, very good point. In fact, I would, uh, uh, what he says brings to mind like a, a modern example, okay? So you're a, you're a hiker, you're out in Yellowstone, you've gotten lost, you do have a radio. You don't know how a radio works, but you do know that if I, if, I, if I turn this thing on and I have a light and I press this button, it, it'll supposedly talk to somebody. And so you are lost, you turn the thing on, I don't know how that worked. I press the button, I don't understand how that works. And I say, I need help. And the rescue helicopter didn't even, where are you? I don't know, that's okay, it's got GPS in there and it sends it out to them. The helicopter shows up, can you imagine somebody trying to, to tell, meeting this hiker on the ground. This hiker's like, I'm lost, I need rescue. And they're like, well, look, if you don't understand how the radio works, and you don't understand the principles of flight for a helicopter, and you don't understand how a winch works or GPS, then there's just no way you're going to be saved. No, I'm telling you, I was saved because I made a call, and the helicopter came and picked me up. They're like, that's nonsense. If you don't understand the mechanism of the salvation, then you are not saved. I'm not in Yellowstone anymore. I'm, I'm here in a diner in, in L.A. I'm telling you, you're not saved, right? The, the same the same idea applies. We feel in the modern world like we have to understand it in order for it to be part of our life. No, you don't. You don't have to understand salvation anymore. You have to understand Bernoulli's principles of lift to be rescued by a helicopter. All right, so uh, let's take that and and expand a little further. So let's say you're the hiker and you pick up your smartphone, your two-way radio, your GPS tracker, your little flintlock thingy, your your muscle aching harness. You don't know what any of them are. You're clicking and pressing everything. You don't know what's going to work. Yes. Put that over into um, a religious context. Like, okay, I hear, I'm picking up what you're laying down. Yeah. Which one of these ones is right? Here's what I would say to that one. Yeah. At the end of your story, as you're sitting in the diner in L.A. telling the story of rescue from Yellowstone, when they say, so you made a call. Did you call via a smartphone? Did you call via this? I called via all of them. I called via all of them. And, what, and they said, who came and picked you up? Well, who answered the call? Right, and the stories out there are Verizon will save you. The stories out there is uh, the U.S. Coast Guard will save you. The stories out, but it wasn't. It was, uh, you know, Piston Peak Air Attack, <laughs> for those familiar with the kids' movies. Piston Peak Air Attack sent a rescue helicopter. It was uh, so Piston Peak to pick it up. Your answer is not, so worship all of them. So when you are saved, you say, great, I had I, I, I hedged my bets and I was saved. No, the answer so is, really if you, you make the call, God will respond. 
And, and to me, um, what, uh, through, I happen to believe some of the stories that have come out of missionary trips to, uh, to uh, Sunni areas of the Islamic world that have had particular responses where these people went in and made a request about who's Isa and, you know, I want to pray to Allah, which, as we discussed in this class, is just Arabic for God. It's, it's not, it doesn't mean a, per, uh, a particular demigod or subgod or whatever. It's the exact same word. If you're going to say the God of Christianity, Allah is the way it's going to be written in, those, in, uh, in, the, in an Arabic Bible. So if, you, if they have made a call and said, um, have some sort of uh, response back to me, the fact that these, you know, 41, I think it was, Muslim imams, in this one town in Iraq are leading their people into the fountain to be baptized in the name of Isa. That is not any kind of Quranic or Hadithic procedure that's gonna get called out, right? That is a, that is a particularly, peculiarly Christian uh, way of doing things. And so with they call to God and you see baptisms in the name of Jesus, from folks who have no concept of baptism in the name of Jesus to mean anything that has to do with salvation, that to me seems to be evidence that needs to be looked at about whether you, what radio you call on matters. Or it may be the, you know, in, in the um, aviation world, 121.5 is the emergency frequency. You can come up on 121.5 and talk anytime, and supposedly someone will hopefully be there and listen and, and respond. I've never seen to get anybody, uh, hear anybody talking on it. But uh, that's the one of like, if someone is out there kind of thing. And in, even in the aviation world, if someone keys the mic and says, we have a problem, this is where I am, if anybody's out there, come and help us. No pilot turns around and be like, well, he didn't, he didn't say my call sign, he's not talking to me. In the same way that we're good enough if someone calls for rescue to, to reach out and be like, I can hear you, then can, do we really imagine that God's like, oh, I didn't use my name, I'm not talking to him. That just that doesn't seem plausible. So it seems to me that God will reach back out to people who reach out to him. We have some scripture that supports that uh, as well. And I think that people who truly seek and are willing to know, God knows that and comes and meets them. I saw a, hand, a couple of hands. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I was just going to say that I think really, like, you get a response from the Holy Spirit. So a lot of people who are seeking, whether they're trying different things, they recognize that that's the only response you're getting. Yeah, that may be so, I think. Good. There was a story with these uh, uh, missionaries walking. Uh, somebody in the church told us was walking in Malaysia somewhere, and these rice farmers like walked, you know, across the farm and said, "Hey, you know, we were waiting for you." And you know, they didn't know anything about Jesus. They didn't know whatever, but they were waiting for him. Yeah, we were told somebody's going to come and tell us good news. Yeah, Re- really. Who, who told them that? Was it the devil? <laughs> you know, was it a god that doesn't exist? Interesting stuff. Yes, I think so. Well, I, there, I, when I say wasn't looking, there, there's, a, there's something to be said for, I don't think God is just like, you know what, I'm in the business of rewarding the best explorers in, in the world. So I don't, I don't think that. What I really mean is, is there's somebody out there who, um, we, we spend so much of our days distracted. You know, 99% of our day, I would, I would hazard, is done, is um, lived thinking about immediate needs, wants, desires, or short-term stuff that all of us would say, in the grand scheme of things, these kinds of things don't, don't matter that much. I mean, yes, it matters whether I eat, because if I haven't been eating, I'm going to die. But if, if uh, you know, exactly what I eat, how it's done, you know, who cares? I won't, I won't remember two days from now, uh, two years from now. The big important questions of life, how much time do we sit thinking about them? Um, the one, I'm, I'm, I've always wanted to do a sermon, uh, even though I've never preached a sermon, so other than what, <laughs> depending on how would you count this stuff as. Um, but like from a pulpit, would love to do a twist on Ken Robinson's talk on education. Some of you have heard this before, 
but something that's just mind-blowing me crazy to me. So K Sir Ken Robinson had, at the time, one of the most popular TED Talk videos or something, uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of views at the time. It, you know, it was well, well ahead of all the other ones. And he basically says, uh, education kills creativity, and he, uh, modern education. He's making a play for, for certain stuff. But he tells the story of this lady whose uh, kid was just all over the place, and she and the uh, teacher says, take her to an educational uh, psychologist. Psychologist sits down with the little girl and the mom, and he talks to him for a while, and then he says to the mom, uh, or he says to the little girl, hey, I, you know, mom and I are going to go talk outside for a minute. Sit here. I'm going to play some mu uh, music for you. And he turns on his radio, his wireless set, uh, and they walk outside, and he takes the mom, and he turns around, and he says, look, look through the, the door. And as soon as they've left the room, the little girl stands up and starts dancing around the room to the music. And he says, you, he says, your daughter is not mentally ill. Your daughter is a dancer. Take her to a dance class and see how it goes. That was the lady who was a choreographer for Cats, who is the most popular musical of all time. This lady was you know, prima for some dance company for whatever else. So clearly, one of her skills in life was something like that. And he says, in today's world, we would have medicated her and told her to sit down and be quiet. And the idea there is not all kids who are on medication are, are misdiagnosed, but rather um, different kids need different education or methodologies, possibly, that the industrial revolution way of doing education. So anyway, that's that one. And it's an interesting, you read the, you listen to the video and you're like, yeah, that's absolutely right. What's his recommendation? And there's no recommendation at the end of the video. And then you're like, well, I'll watch some of his other videos to see what his recommendation are. What's his recommendation? Uh, nope, there's nothing coming yet. I don't know what it is. So I don't know what the point is other than, uh, you know, be nice to your kid. Um, okay, thank you, Ken. Um, consider the options. That's one of them. The one I was thinking of was, you know, what, ask the question, why do we, how much school do we do? Like, mandatorily, we do 13 years of kindergarten through 12 by law. And then a lot of people do another four years. And then some people do another four or six years on top of that. You can spend easily 15 to 20 years in education. And, and you say, what's the purpose of education? Most people would say, purpose of education, get, uh, prepare yourself for life. Well, prepare yourself for life in what way? To be successful in life. Ah, okay, well, what does it mean to be successful in life? Well, and then some people usually say successful career or whatever. Why do you want a successful career? So that you can make enough money and, and be happy. Do stuff you want to do and be happy. So ultimately, happiness is our goal, right? Once you parse it all out, you get down to, it's a way to prepare you for life so that you will be happy in life. Now back up and say, okay, well, what is it that makes you happy in life? Because a lot of schools seem to be about preparing you to pay bills. Um, you know, not much of it's take care of yourself, right? We got one home ec class in there that teaches you not to break eggs if you want to have kids. Um, the, it's bizarre. Um, you certainly can't leave a home ec class if you didn't go in there with the ability to cook a meal. I don't, any home ec class I ever heard of. In the same way, you can't go into a shop class and come out of a wood shop class and be like, I can build my own table and chairs. <laughs> not, not ones I'm going to sit in, I can tell you that much. Uh, so I, I think there's some, uh, I've got to remind you of the shop class thing. If we have time, I'll tell you, tell you that one. The, uh, if, if it's the idea that, that we're supposed to be prepared for life skills, education doesn't seem to give us that. It seems to prepare us to be able to get a job of a certain type or a certain hierarchy in, in the job or, or a job higher up in this hierarchy because Jobs help us make money, which is going to make us happy. Well, let's look at the research. Does money make us happy? No. What we know is beyond, you know, uh, somewhere between forty and sixty thousand dollars, depending on where in the country you live, if you make any more than that, there's literally zero correlation between I make six seventy thousand dollars, I make seven hundred thousand dollars, I make seventy billion dollars, no increase in happiness, reported happiness. It, so if there's no correlation there, and our best science tells us that, the World, ha the world Happiness Survey tells us that, right? Like, they, they surveyed the world. The world says, nope. So if that's the case, what, what is it that does make us happy? And everybody knows the answer to what makes you happy, right? It, it's in every fairy tale, almost every fairy tale ever told. You know, once upon a time, and they all end with, and they lived happily ever after. There's always the prince, the princess, Prince Charming, you know, Cinderella, uh, these two people that come. Their interpersonal love, whether it's between a man and a woman, whether it's between a few friends, whether it's in the, inside the family, whatever it is, that, that love relationship, and in my opinion, there's a special love relationship for those that 
are to be married there. And for those that are to be single, Christ has other guidance. But at the end of the day, that happiness is somehow very, very dependent on love. Love between you and God and love between you and other people. Now, here's the punchline to the whole sermon. Where in all of our 13 to 20 years of education, have we ever taken a class on love, a class on a practicum on love, a lab on love? Like, it sounds silly, but if you go ask, if you go do the man in the street interview, and I don't mean cherry picking them and getting them dumb answers. I mean, ask 20 men in the street, 50 men in the street, women in the street, what is love? I will, I will, I'm not a betting man, but I will bet you a dollar that they, that you will not get out of more than one of them the correct answer, where the correct answer is anywhere near correct. Something like a benevolent, selfless regard for someone else. It's going to be some twisted or partial version of it or completely wrong version of what love is. And we, we have gone through 13 years of education and the thing that the only thing we know will make us happy in any circumstance, we literally don't know the definition of the word. That, if that doesn't make you wonder, then nothing will. <laughs> How is it the case that we've come so far away from the truth that we can't define the word that we know makes us the happiest? Yes, sir. Oh, good. Okay. Thank you. Um, now I'll see if I can find it. Uh, Trump replied. Does that, does that count? Uh, there we go. Well, click it again. Aha. No, no audience. Your answer seems so dynamic. Something involving onions. Yes. Uh, Lang, uh, he's saying no audio right now, I think. <laughs> that was 13 minutes ago. Um, I'm going to make sure I'm on. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'll do it all in. Uh, it's ASL. Yeah, right. No, it's not an important point. Uh, so I think um, the point I'm getting at there is sit, to, the, to the earlier situational question or to the, to the question of like, um, what, are, what are we supposed to do with the world that's presented to us? How much of a searcher do we have to be? God is not in the business of rewarding the explorer. All of us have the same desires. But to those of us who he knows actually want that love relationship, but because we've lived in a society that puts us through 13 years of, of education and yet hasn't bothered to tell us what the definition of the thing is that's going to make us happy, I think if, if we want to know it, God finds us. And um, beyond that, now when we want more, he does say, ask and it will be given you, seek and you shall find, knock and it will be opened unto you. And the idea there is not prosperity gospel. Well, what I would really like is an airplane. You know, ask in accordance with the kingdom. This is, um, I'll give you the one last example and then we'll move to the next question. <coughs> I like using the Marine Corps because everybody understands that the Marine Corps is a bunch of fanatics, right? People join the Marine Corps because it's the Marine Corps. They join the Marine Corps because they want to be a Marine. Uh, whatever, whether that's a good reason for doing that or a bad reason for doing that. And there are people, definitely people who do both, and more for bad reasons than good reasons, in my experience. But at the end of the day, nobody, if you join the Marine Corps, you enlist, you go through boot camp, you go through whatever else, you get assigned out to your unit, and the first sergeant says, hey, hey, gents, let me tell you something. I came from an infantry unit, it was the only guy, so it's never, ladies and gents. Uh, hey, ladies and gents, if you need anything, all you got to do is ask, Okay. If you want anything, all you got to do is look for it. And any time that you need something, you come knock on my door, you got it. No Marine interprets that to be like, hey, first sergeant, just want to let you know I, I, I really want a car. And first, like, hey, hey Marine, you want to know something? Go out and clean the latrine. You know, that, that's going to be the answer he's going to get from first sergeant there. Actually, he's going to get, Gunny, take care of your troop here. So uh, when you go to the first sergeant or to the captain or the major or the colonel and you knock on the door and you ask, what, is he, what did he mean by that? As you are doing your marine stuff, if you guys are short on what you need, you let me know, I'll get it to you. You're short on ammunition, let us know. You're short on water and chow, you let us know. You don't have the training that it, that it takes for, me to, for you to execute the missions that I'm going to give you, you let me know, I'll get you that training, marine. That's what everybody, every marine knows that. Maybe even the army guys know that. So at the, uh, at the end of the day, I'm joking, there's a little inner service pokery going on there. Um, the folks in the military understand that that is a bounded statement with an implication 
that says, for the good of the mission and the service, the morale, health, and welfare of the unit, and the mission that the unit is taking on, you ask and it will be given you. The kingdom is exactly that way. The kingdom is exactly that way. In that, no Christian should join on and be like, well, yeah, I want to be part of the kingdom of God, but I, what I really want is a car. You know, that, that doesn't make sense in the same way that nobody would claim that that Marine was using good sense and knocking on the door of the first, sorry. So you mean like getting a G6 isn't like part of Christianity? No, apparently, you know, it doesn't seem to, exactly right. Touche to that guy. I don't, I don't think it is. Uh, Kevin reports sound is good. Thank you, Link. Um, so I think that there's something to be said there. If you can understand, if you, if you understand what the kingdom about is about. And we're not talking about rocket science here. We're talking about stuff Marines can understand. Nobody has said, well, if a Marine can understand it, that doesn't necessarily mean anybody can understand it, right? We talk about stuff being Marine simple. Army Claymore mines say front towards enemy. Marine Claymore mines say do not eat. That kind of thing. So uh, it's a sta standard joke. <laughs> the, the MRE instructions actually have the little heater that you pour water into. It's a chemical heater. And it's got a picture on it. And it's got an arrow pointing to it. It says prop it up on rock or something. Like, they had to draw that diagram for us, for the Marines. That's who you had to draw that diagram for. Yeah, that's right. If you don't do it, it'll go, it'll go wrongly. So uh, the Marines, if, if uh, I'm not, the Marines also, they're brilliant men and women in the Marine Corps. There are also some men and women in the Marine Corps that are, not, that are not brilliant. But at the end of the day, the bottom line is Marines aren't necessarily world famous for intellect. They're necessarily famous for being Marines and for being aggressively good at fighting. But the bottom line is, uh, if it can be understood by a Marine, it's probably a decent argument that it can be understood by the rest of humanity. And Marines get it. You join the Marine Corps not to enrich your own personal self, but so that you can contribute to something greater than you and you get the honor of being a part of it. So that it's not uh, when someone comes in from, the, and I, I will pick on the Army a little bit for this one right here. If I'm in the Army, and, and, uh, and he can say this because he holds all of these tabs, and it's almost not enough to first when someone says, I'm in the Army. What do you do? I'm in the Army. Oftentimes, the Army guy will be like, I'm, uh, I you know, serve with, uh, with the military. Where? In the Army. What do you do for the Army? I'm a Ranger. I'm a Special Forces troop. Now, the Special Forces troop often will play a game of not telling you that kind of stuff. I knew one that uh, when they were out you know, in, in the bars or whatever, hanging around because they had shaved heads and whatever else, they would tell people they were a Bush League NASCAR uh, team. And this guy was the driver, and these were the whatever else. But they were playing a game, right? At the end of the day, they were almost like, you're not good enough to know what, what we actually do. Uh, but at the end of the day, for people that are rangers or are special forces or whatever else, they want that dif to be differentiated that way because there are so many people in the Army. The Marine Corps is enough of a cult that it's enough for a Marine, no matter what you do in the Marine Corps, to say, I'm a Marine because you're proud to be a Marine because that name comes with, with the Marine Corps, or at least Marines think that it does, <laughs> which is the same thing uh, sometimes. So uh, in the same way, you, you almost want to say, if, if you understood, you participate in being a Marine because of the, a bunch of reasons, but it's also an honor just to say you're a Marine. In the same way, when someone asks you if you're a Christian, or who you are, or what you do, if you really understand Christianity, if you really understand the kingdom of God, I've said this before, nobody, nobody does it. I don't actually do it, but I don't do it for the same reasons that maybe those SF troops don't, is you almost want to say, I'm an ambassador and son of the Lord of the universe, you know, or daughter of the Lord of the universe. You know, that, that's what's, I mean, right, right, right. But the, the idea is a, the least participant in the kingdom of heaven is an adopted son of God. Uh, son of God, adopted son of God, Marine. You know, not on the same level. <laughs> but yet, these are the ways we identify ourselves, not this way. Why? If why is an intentional pursuit of humility, okay. But that should be sitting in the back the whole time. In the same way, uh, I'll tell one more anecdote just to get it through, and I'm going to get some of this wrong, but advanced engineering class, uh, a bunch of young engineering students that are going, to, going for their PhD, old dude, 55 years old in the class. Have I told this story in here before already? Um, and he's actually not doing terribly well in the class, B and C student. <coughs> and eventually they get to some question three quarters of the way through the semester. And they're going to have a couple guys come in from, maybe it was JPL, Jet Propulsion Lab, like one of the engineering meccas of the United States. And they, they teach this class or whatever, and they lay out this problem set. And somebody 
uh, makes some claim and the guy, the 55 year old finally raises his hand and goes, actually that, that's not accurate. Um, in, my, in my lab the other day, we, uh, I'm sorry, it wasn't JPO, it was somebody else came in and, and did this. And he says, in my, uh, in my lab the other day, we worked with these two metals and together they have a better, you know, whatever. And the teacher is like, really? And he was like, yeah. And he says, you wanna come up and show us that on the board? And the guy said, okay. And he comes up and fills the board full of these equations. And everybody's like, and he's like, where's this lab? He goes, Jet Propulsion Lab. And everybody's, uh, he didn't tell anybody it was JPL, which the JPL is like uh, Harvard, Yale, MIT rolled together for engineering kind of thing, right? So that, that's, this guy has all the badges. And then they were like, really? He never sat down again. He, they handed him the teaching the class from that point forward. The instructor later comes to him and was like, I'm sorry, your answers were just so different from everybody else's that I just assumed they were wrong. I didn't even understand them. So like, <laughs> right, that's pretty amazing. But that, that's what it's like. That's, that's what it would, that's in some way what it's like, is if you really know God and the rest of humanity is casting, so in that class, what everybody wants is excellent engineering knowledge. They want to be able to do that kind of stuff. Now forget ability and instead say, what is it that we desire most between happiness and love and peace and all that stuff, the stuff that we really want, the reasons we do all those things, the reason we want to be great engineers or great troops or great whatever else is so that we have the respect of other people because that's one form of love that we want because we've given up on being loved by other people we're happy to have merely their respect that's honestly how i think it boils down to at least for me that's what it seemed like when i diagnosed it on myself and so if that's if it's the case that what we really want is love then why would we not be the most excited about being ninjas in love you know what I mean? And being highly knowledgeable and experienced in love. If you know and love God, if you have that, that experience of love with God and you understand it so well, you are the JPL engineer in a class of people who are looking for a modicum of that experience. Yes. New, new patterns, new habits. Yes. Um, and so there's a sense of figuring out a way to, and, to and, I, and I can only think it's through seeking God daily and refining it, refining yourself. So the goal is to have a goal in my mind to seek God so that through, through reading his word. Yes. Yes. It becomes a little bit more clear. And, and I think then that's also why we go in faith and say, hey, I'm going to, I don't know why, but let's see if I can help this person. And somehow God, that's, that's, that's an aspect of the kingdom of God. In, and you learn, I think, a little bit from her. I do. Yeah. And, and when you get in those situations where you're loving, it seems like you're in the right track. It, and things start to make sense, at least in my, my experience, because it's like, I may not say this at the time, but things are clicking. Yes. Things are right. Yes. And so I could ask, I could, I, I'm more in line with the kingdom of God. And so then, so then the question comes back to me, is, and the, the, the critical thing is, then how do I, how do I get to that? Point? Yes. And it seems to be some sort of intentional finality <coughs> of a focus and, and also of avoiding distraction, which you know. The goal of education is is really to create new behaviors, and that you know, I mean, well, a goal 
Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I got you. You're right. You're right. Yes. Sure. And a knowledge base element that you have to have this knowledge in order to do those behaviors. Right. Yeah, I got you. Element is you want to know how to do math. So let's figure right, out right. how to do this. Or look, you want to know how to. So I, um, uh, I agree with you very much. I'm going to be accused here, so let me get it, of trying to remake the kingdom in, in the mil, into the, the mold of the military. I'm trying to use the military as an analogy because I think it's it, in, in these ways makes a good analogy. Let me contrast two, two um, sides of the military for you very quickly, and then let me tell you the point, which I think lines up exactly with what Steve's saying, which is, I think, a very, very good point. The United States Air Force Academy, right? They hand-select, supposedly, all these men and women from being you know, the best and the smartest and the brightest or whatever else. They then take them and they give them ranks, ranging from cadet airmen up to cadet colonel. And there's this hierarchy, and you can, this guy can order that guy around, and this lady can order this guy around, and all that kind of stuff. They, what's, so he, they've got a bunch of rank. At the end of this four years, what the product, and I'm a product of the system, so I, I'm okay to criticize it, I think. You end up with very cynical people at the end of these four years of time. Very cynical. And I asked myself the question, why, why is everybody coming out of here so cynical? And, and, fairly, and a fair amount of immaturity as well. Um, but why so cynical? The answer occurs to me that it's because we gave people authority and told them to issue orders, and they don't have a mission. Right? The colonel can order the airman to do what? Clean up his room? Fold his underwear and socks a certain way? March in a certain way to, to chow and then to class? Because that's what you do with your rank. You march around in large, in battle formations that were last useful in the Napoleonic Wars uh, and really were most useful in the Greek Wars. And we still do that today for Air Force Academy, right? Where the number of people who march into battle in the Air Force is exactly zero. And so you, you want to wonder, like, what, what do we think we're doing here? And the answer is you're breeding cynicism. You're breeding cynicism because none of the authority that you have and none of the tasks that you do with that authority are in any way related to the mission goal. The mission goal is eat food and learn stuff and graduate, which civilians seem to do very, very well without having to march anywhere, and without anybody having to order them what to do, right? People go to college all the time and graduate without them being told to be, do so by another student. So uh, that's one way of doing things. The other way is something like the Marine Corps, the Army, or, or you know, one of the, where you've got a mission. You know what you're supposed to do. Steve, to your point, <coughs> it, we, uh, nobody in the, who's a Marine wakes up in the Marine Corps and says, you know, I'm really distracted by a lot of other things in my life. <laughs> Why? Because they live as a unit of Marines in Marine barracks, and they're told at the beginning of the day, you will get up at this time, and then we're going to tell you what to do. And then you're going to do it. And then we're going we're gonna to hot wash how it went and tell you how well you did what you were supposed to do. And then we'll go to sleep and do it again. Once every, uh, you know, on a weekend, you're supposed to have two days off. No Marine has two days off on the weekend, right? They, they are supposed to be on liberty. You know, you get 72 hours off or 48 hours off or 24 hours off at different times. But at the end of the day, here, go out in the world, do something else. You usually get in trouble. I have to come bail them out of jail. And then they come back into the Marine Corps and they go marining around again. Why is it the case that Marines are not distracted by non-Marine things? Or when they are, uh, uh, this is just leading from one story and another, uh, Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, used to be run by a guy named Chesty Puller. He was a colonel that was famous uh, in the Marine Corps and for his actions in, in Korea. And the, there's a little town just right here's the Marine base at Camp Lejeune. Here's the burgeon, massive town called Jacksonville. It's a terrible place. But there's a, there was a little town right off to the side here, and that was the town at the time. This thing didn't exist. And these guys were absolutely taking the Marines to the bank, you know, predatory loan type of stuff. They were, everything they could do to take money from Marines. Chesty hears about this, and he walks over to the commerce you know, group and was like, hey, gents, you guys got to stop doing this to my Marines. And their answer back was, hey, Colonel, why don't you run your base and let us run our town? Uh, that's our business. It's our business model. If your Marines are too dumb to get it, that's your problem. You know what he did? Drew a circle around this town and said, Marines, this area is now off limits. Any Marine found in there will be subject to non-judicial punishment and court-martial. This town died, and the skeletons of that town, overnight, the skeleton of the town is still there. Buildings that are 
collapsing. And I mean, it's, it is dead. Jacksonville took it all up. And so now all the strip clubs and car uh, dealerships and, and uh, whatever else uh, are up there. So uh, my point, and then to Justin's point, my point is um, the Marines understand how to keep distraction from their Marines. This was causing my Marines to have difficulty because they were becoming personally indebted, inducing stress upon them. I got a way to fix that. You, no Marines can go there anymore. Now, I'm not arguing that the church should be the Marine Corps, but what I'm saying is the Marines take themselves out of society. They dress differently. They act differently. They commit themselves to different things. They live in different groups. Now, those doesn't mean those groups can't go out, but Marines tend to show up to bars en masse. They don't tend to show up one at a time. Maybe later, after they've Marined a little while, they figure out how to do that and enjoy it. But oftentimes, here comes a group of Marines. Here comes trouble, right? Uh, and instead of being trouble, though, the kingdom should be the opposite, right? Here's a, gr here's a group of people who are, maybe you don't have to dress alike, but you associate together. You live in that. You, you train. You have a mission. You have stuff. You don't want to be... Right now, we have a little bit of Air Force Academy Christianity. You've got hierarchies, you've got stuff, you've got maybe orders that are going on, you've got teaching that's going on, but you don't have a mission. What is it that we're supposed to go out and do? The Marines do have a mission and they get it. Even if that was training, they were training like fanatics. Why in Christianity do we not do something like that? By the way, Jewish culture, that's the same point. Dress funny, act funny and talk funny. When I say funny, I don't mean actually funny, I mean different. The word the Bible uses for it is holy set apart, dedicated. Marines are holy, their culture is holy towards warfare, which is not a, maybe a less holy objective. But Christianity's holiness is dedicated towards relationship with God and love towards fellow man. Justin. So <coughs> it always surprises me when people talk about, about you know, Dallas and everything, because I have like zero, right, because of my lived experience. But it doesn't mean that I know it. Sometimes education can lead you away. Just like, but if you need that education for a certain thing. So what I was thinking is, it's more like an inverted bell curve. If your life is to be a monk, you don't really need, unless you're doing certain things, you don't really need education. You just need to be able to read the Bible, right? And yes. that's how you get to hold of it. But if you're um, <coughs> going into a foreign land, you might need to know a different language and culture and all there's a lot of education to be able to go and, and minister yes so i think it's you know it but to me the doubts come from fear and fear generally comes it's one of the weapons of the devil that is you know tells you these things well uh, yes and some of this from uh, maybe this wasn't his his core point but a tangential point on what he just said specific to like kind of education what, what's your number one complaint about what is one of your key complaints about your own education? If it's anything like what I've heard, it's probably something like this. I did, take, I did spend a bunch of time studying stuff that I, never, I knew I was never going to use, right? Anything in literary criticism that I did as, as, you know, in high school or college, that, as an example. A bunch of math stuff that I'm like, when am I ever going to use this? It turned out later, uh, it would have been really helpful. I wish I'd have paid more attention there. Uh, that math stuff was more useful. But at the end of the day... It was a, uh, t tell me again how I'm going to use this, or am I wasting my time? The same, it, to, to Justin's point, notice he calls out, you know, for the monk, if the, it's purpose-driven education. If you're going to be a monk, then your education should only be this big so that you can do this very well. Don't bother with the other stuff. It's going to be a distraction. It's going to make you unhappy, whatever. If you're going to go be a missionary, don't learn 17 languages. Go learn the language of the place that you're going and get really good at it. Then you're going to be okay. You've got to <coughs> know what you're supposed to do in Christianity in order to educate yourself in Christianity, but who tells you what you're supposed to do in Christianity? Who tells you what you're supposed to do in the Marine Corps? So I'm going to be guilty. I think Christianity is just like the Marine Corps in this one. Who tells you what you're going to do in the Marine Corps? Well, the Commandant of Maria. Yes, right. right. So you're appealing to the ultimate authority, right? Sort of, right? So you join them, you show up to the Marine Recruiting Depot. You show up to the church to, to be saved, all right? And at uh, the Marine Recruiting uh, Office. Hey, I want to be a Marine. Hey, I want to be a Christian. What does the guy say to you? Great, you come in, and I'm going to make you an infantryman. I'm going to make you a helicopter mechanic. Is that it? Is that how it goes? What do they actually do? 
They do a bunch of tests. They got, some guys come in and they're like, I had, I had one of these. Some guys come in and they said, um, uh, I would really like to be a helicopter mechanic, and they look, which is not an easy job. And they look at the scores and they're like, Devil Dog, that would be a good, uh, you know, that's a good thing. Let me tell you about some other options. Here's, how, here's driving trucks. Here's being an infantryman, you know, because uh, minimum requirement, by the way, to be an infantryman is 80 IQ. Minimum requirement to be a helicopter mechanic, I think, is probably something like 112 or 115. Yeah, for the Marines. Yeah, it's probably true. For the Marines, it was, it was uh, um, 80 so, or something like that, 85 maybe. So uh, at the end of the day, there was some matching of skill and desire, but they ask you what you want to do. I had a, my second squad leader in, in the infantry went in from Tennessee, and he's like, I want to crawl around in the woods and shoot people. And they're like, all right, um, uh, here, take some tests. And they're like, what's the highest degree you have? He says, I have a master's degree. In what? Physical therapy. You know, okay, here's all this other stuff you can do in the metal field. I don't want to do that. I want to crawl around in the woods, and I want to shoot people. And they're like, here, here's your infantry contract there, high speed. Uh, so he did. He joined the infantry. You get a vote about what you want to do. God's not interested in bringing you in and making you a helicopter mechanic if you're not fit to be a helicopter mechanic. He's not interested in making you an infantryman or truck driver if you've got the intellect to do some of this other stuff. I have a buddy that went and took the tests at the, at the center and basically maxed everything. And when he asked the, the guy, what, what job should I do? And he says, people that score on your tests don't join this service. <laughs> Go somewhere else. Yeah, and he did. He went to the Air Force. Uh, so uh, at the end of the day, actually, they told him basically don't join the military. And he's one of those kind of the guys who's like, I'll do the opposite of what you said. And I'll join the military anyway. Uh, but at any rate, it, it's the case that you want, <coughs> even in the kingdom, you show up and God almost, I feel like God can say to you, what do you want to do? And when you say, I want to be an ex for the, yeah. I think you're on a better point before that I think you haven't explored is in that analogy is the pastor the colonel you're right. So where's the squad leader? Where's the, the local direction for things? Because I think most people today live as cultural Christians. We come in, we hear from the higher ups, and then the rest of the time, what are we doing? You know? So the, uh, that's, that's a great point. Now, here's where there's a major divergence between Christianity and the military, right? And the military... Access to the general. Uh, at, yes. yes. The commandant... You have a radio to talk to the commandant at any time, right? And, and so it is the case that sometimes you're like, the radio's not working, in which case the guy next to you is like, you don't, you're not using your radio, right? Or, hey, you're, you're standing 15 feet away from the radio. It doesn't work that way, right? And that's what we're all, we're all, all of us in this room to some point, I certainly even today, stand 15 feet of radio. And I'm like, why can I not hear God? What is the matter? Why is God not talking to me? Go, go do what he said. Stand next to the radio, key the mic then talk, and then try listening. See if listening works for you. Lord, I really need this. Why is he not answering me? And the, <laughs> the radio's like, oh, here's the answer to your question. Like, I can't hear anything. Yeah. Idiot. It's too late. We're already there. You might as well join. So, I'm just going to dive in both feet. So, um, I think the, um, the analogy kind of, kind of falls apart in the, in the interim there where we're talking about <laughs> level leaders and all that stuff, right? So, there is something in the military <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, in the last like 20 years or so, they've really gone to something called Mission Command, where it's like, we don't need to tell the private, like, how to skin the cat. We just need to tell them that the cat needs to get skinned, right? And then, like, we, we basically issue, like, commanders and tank and fraud, like, left and right limits. Mm -hmm. Like, here's the end state. Here's what I need you guys to do. Your mission gets you that end state. Here are the left and right limits of how you accomplish that mission. Go forth and accomplish the mission. And it empowers everything way, way, way down. Small. Well, we had to do this in Iraq and Afghanistan fighting a regular war. And so I think that is a, probably a better analogy. I, I think, you know, waiting on like the Pope or, you know, whoever to like. The modern church orders. isn't set up that way. That, but that's what I'm saying. I think, like, I think that's it's still an old time command and control. Right. All the, look at all the works that they do. They wait for, hey, it's, you know, whatever date we're going to do this big thing, and then we all do that, and then everything else, nothing. So I, this is just my opinion, but I think like if I got to talk to God for a day and I asked him that question, I think he'd be like, yeah, it's kind of like it's kind of like Mission Command. Like you have the Bible, you've got Jesus, 
you got, you know, all this, you've got a, a core group of individuals, you know, that you lean on, like accountability partners and, and, and people that you come to church to, to bounce ideas off of and learn with, but then it's kind of on you to, like, go do it. And it's not such a Byzantine. So I, I agree with the, I agree uh, vehemently with the major point here. I will quibble for the sake of quibbling and for introducing this this brief story uh, with one part of that. So I think that's mostly right. But uh, all analogies break down. Right. World War II. These are actually uh, Germans, and the 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 circles on the bottom are German units. The X's and boxes on the top are uh, enemies to the German units. The idea was that you know here was this hilltop right here, and uh, there was a major unit on it. There was supposed to be another unit here on this other hilltop. And uh, the mission was, all right, this guy, you're supposed to go here and basically block to prevent these guys from reinforcing. We're going to go hit this, hit this unit here, and we're going to take this hilltop up here. So this is a lieutenant down here, and here's the captains and lieutenants and whatever else. This lieutenant comes up to the top of the hill. There's nobody on the hill. And his mission order he had been given was, uh, go attack this hill in order to prevent, you know, reinforcement of these troops. Or, uh, go attack this hill, actually, was the order that he had. Um, and he goes up here and attacks this hill, and there's nobody there. Now, as it turns out, this unit was back here. And when these guys became engaged, this unit maneuvered over here to reinforce these guys. These guys end up winning the fight. This guy ends up holding his position over here because his mission was take this hill. After this is all over, they fire the lieutenant fired for following his orders. His orders were, go hit this hill. Why? Why'd they fire the lieutenant? That wasn't the point. And as a lieutenant is supposed to know, be smart enough in warfare to say, the reason the captain sent me here was so that these guys don't end up reinforcing these guys when we're in the middle of fighting them. I didn't figure that out, and I didn't maneuver to pre prevent that one. Doesn't mean that he's not, he's not a useful soldier. What it means is he's not a useful platoon right. commander. Yeah, but to, the trouble is too <clears throat> atomized as individuals to go out and actually make big differences or even in some cases small differences. My point, but the point here is this. God doesn't want everybody to be a lieutenant. God doesn't want everybody to be a captain. If you've got a unit of Marines, all of whom are captains, you've got chaos. In fact, they have those in, in TBS. They put all the lieutenants together in a platoon, and that platoon runs around and fights. And it's the most dysfunctional unit you've ever seen. Yes. But it takes another skill set complementary to make something work. And the fact that we're such atomized individuals today, there's no, you know, there's no grouping. To the, those, two, those two works of the spirit will never happen because this skill and this skill never get together. So I agree with, if you're not listening to your radio. So ultimately, I think it's the, so I agree with you. But it's the case that what's the, what's the well, let me ask, what's the solution to atomization? I think. Yeah, the, the idea is you're not going to, and you're not going to fight as a platoon if you don't get together as a platoon and figure out what you're going to do. You, you, uh, are we supposed to take this world on one Christian at a time? Well, yeah, you take on being a Marine or an Army man or air, Airman or whatever, one Airman at a time, but you, both point, you're sub part of a, a unit. You're part of the kingdom, and if you're not dealing with other kingdom people, to use some of the Old Testament stuff, you know, we're, they're going to go back, and Nehemiah's going to go back and rebuild the wall and the gates. They've got groups of people building portions of the wall. You know, they gotta, they're going to do that. It's not like we're going to go back and build a wall. Each guy go back, find whatever brick he wants, put it in place. Imagine the wall you have if you build it like that. You, you, if you have a work to do, a work for the kingdom to do, there's, it's, it bears having a plan. There probably is something God intends to do there. So by all means, don't do it atomized, as Justin points out. Do it as part of a unit, but how do you do that? Well, let's answer that very specifically. The answer is this. You come together, like uh, uh, a Marine Corps unit never gets tasked before it's a unit, right? The Commandant turn around and say, 2nd Battalion, I want you guys to go do the following task. What battalion are you talking to, Commandant? Well, it hasn't formed yet, but I want you to put men into it. What you turn around and do is say, here's a bunch of Marines who've come together. They've trained as an infantry unit. They have infantry skills. Now that unit shows up. And the commandant says, this trained unit who knows how to do this, I want to go do that thing. If you're interested in doing something in the kingdom, you get to pick what your specialty is. God seems to give us a vote in that one. 
pick something that you're interested in. Tell God that you want to be, um, you want to do that. If you want to become an infantryman, it's not a bad idea to, to then get a slot to the School of Infantry, which the Marine Corps will sign you up for without too much of your own involvement. Uh, and you go to it, and then you learn. Why do we as Christians not do this? Say, hey, I would really like to be, I would love to be a, a healer in, you know, a miraculous healer. And what do we do? God, will you make me a healer? You know, I want to be a really knowledgeable teacher. God, will you make me a knowledgeable teacher? God, I really want to be a great encourager. God, will you make me an encourager? What, everybody else in the world seems to know that when you want to know a skill set, you go find somebody who's already been trained by the competent authority in that skill set so that you understand it a little bit. Why don't, why don't we do that? The answer is maybe Justin's answer. We've decided that all this can be done individually or we're not sold on the mission. <coughs> Yeah, and, and by the way, uh, it, it, all that doesn't happen without God's involvement. So let's do a quick, a super quick case study on John 6 to, to, Steve's, to what I think Steve's driving at here. Everybody knows the story. J Jesus feeds the 5,000, right? Wh why did Jesus feed the 5,000? Somebody tell me why. Why were they hungry? Okay, so here you have a group of people who follow Christ. They make the effort to come out and hear him. He literally is like, you're here to get knowledge, purportedly. I will take care of your needs. The whole, like, don't remember the sparrows? Remember the grass of the field? Don't worry about it. I will feed you. So they're literally out there with no thought to their own food, but they are thought to the, to the food of the kingdom. That's a good thing. God rewards it and literally gives them food. Then what does he do? The second that, now by the way, uh, they saw the sign Jesus had performed. They begin to say, truly this is the prophet who has to come into the world. Then Jesus, <coughs> realizing they were about to come and make him king by force, withdrew to the mountain. Right? Literally, how many people are like that one? I've become so popular, people want to make me king. I better get out of here. Last thing in the world I want to be made is king by these guys. Right? Right. It's, not a, rare, it's a rare thing. So at... Dave Chappelle, right. <laughs> that, right. It happens on a, a few times in history, but they're notable times in history. So, uh, but you see the point, right? This is, a, uh, this is not the normal reaction. Why did Jesus do this? He must not be interested in being made king at this time. Because this is not a bad time to do it. There's your groundswell starting, right? And by the way, expectation that the Messiah was coming to free them from the yoke of the Romans wasn't at an all-time low at this time. Okay, not a bad possible launch point. Uh, th this topic is trending, right? <laughs> so it, why, why does he do that? Because he's not interested in that kind of kingdom. Not the kingdom. I think he hasn't also, he hasn't finished the message and that would to go in a direction that doesn't allow him to finish 
So he literally puts a body of water between him and them that he walks across in order to get there. And then the next day, the crowd who remained on the other side of the sea realized that only one boat had been there and Jesus had not boarded it with his disciples. They got him cut off, but he'd walked away from it. Oh, we got God boxed in here. He's got to do what we want him to do. I think he just walked on water and he's no longer there. Uh, however, when some boats from Tiberias arrived near the place they'd eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went looking for him. They found him and said, when did you get here? And then he goes into a bunch of stuff that doesn't seem to make sense. But he basically says this, truly, I tell you, it's, it's not because you saw these signs that you were looking for me. Okay, I, he's saying, I've tested you and this is what, what the result is so far. But because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that perishes, but for food that endures to eternal life. What you came out to hear me tell, or what I am telling you if you came out to hear me talk, is about the food for eternal life. You got distracted by the daily stuff that I provided for you. I provided that for you. It wasn't a bad thing. It was keeping you alive. But rather than pay attention to the words that should have mattered, you paid attention to the bread and the loaf, the fishes that I fed you, and now all you want from me is bread and fish instead of the words of life that lead to eternal life. So I fled you. And now, what must we do to perform the works of God? The work of God is this, to believe in the one in whom he has sent. And, the, and the, let the, I'll let you read the discussion. But then he says, uh, okay, you know what? Truly I tell you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that anyone may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And this bread which I will give the life of the world is my flesh. And at this point, he had the opportunity to clarify exactly what he meant, what we understand today. But what does he do? Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood of the Son of Man, you have no life in you. Now, what happens? Anybody remember what happens? They leave in droves. They leave in droves. So what he's doing is he's filtering. Filtering for the... Uh, he provided the call to, like, lots of people... Lots of people respond, not a lot of people, when he says, this is what it's about, not that. Like, they followed him again, went to the other side of the, to the, of the sea, followed him again. Hey, we're, we're all about making you king. He's like, I'll, I'm going to be a king, but not your way. This is a point, when you think about it in the, in the larger abstract, this is a very poignant, um, hopefully nobody's being actually killed outside, um, very poignant person, he's probably okay, right? Um, point. God will run away from us in some ways, will, will distance himself from us if when we come to him we pursue our own goals under his umbrella. That's just by saying he says no sometimes, which is his best answer. Yes, and when he says no, and, and all of us may make great arguments. Look, you are the son of man. You are the son of God. You should be king. Let's make you king. And he says, no, not right now, or no. And we're, then what do we tell God at that point? If you're like me, what do you tell God? No, you're wrong. You, don't, you, just, you, don't, you don't see it. <laughs> so, sorry, did you just say what I think you said? And we try to make him do it by force, or we try to make him do it by just continuing to ask him or whatever else. So we still want the Gulf Stream. We keep asking for the Gulf Stream. Like yeah, we are we're a bunch of kids. Yeah, <laughs> right. So, so I bring this... Uh, we haven't, and this is a, if I have, if I got to choose a complaint about Western Protestant churches, it's this. There's no instantiation, instantiated, codified discipleship construct. That's how it was done in the beginning. Everybody has a discipler. Everybody has a disciple. And even the early church fathers, you know, Clement is, or, and, you know, Justin Martyr and all these guys, they... They can tell you who their discipler was. And some of them, John was their discipler. And some of them, you know, the fact that you've got somebody that you go to who you know for a fact has that contact with God, who is a, such a godly man or woman that you can be like, I can ask that, that person I know knows Jesus, knows, you know, the, the God of the universe. Why don't we do that? <laughs>
Yes. And then even within those, he may have focused even more on certain people. Yes. Just because he could and because they really, really wanted to. Yes, them. yes. And, and so, and I have a picture in my mind of what that looks like. And, and he was encouraging everybody else to do the exact same thing. I'll buy, I'll buy that. And I'll, I'll say that's, you know, Steve, I think you're right. At least if for those who haven't grown up in the youth group here at RBC, RBC's youth group is a very uh, is the, probably the most intentional and structured youth group I've ever seen ever. They, Bob Schul and his cohort do a really good job of that one. Uh, Bob Schul's right hand sits among us, or uh, his former right hand, uh, who cleaned up all the messes that Bob would leave in the same way that I leave messes behind. Somebody more responsible and smarter has to come and clean up. But at the end of the day, that seemed to be part of his model. And he would turn around and, and his leaders would then focus on the people that, that wanted to be focused on to some degree. And I do think that that is a decent model of how God does it too. He's not, and you know, uh, pr professors and instructors do this too, right? They don't pour their lives into disinterested students. When the student comes up and asks questions and you can tell, and you know, you all know the different students, the showboating student that just wants to be heard in the class for the, what they have to do. The, uh, the student that wants to tell the instructor why they're so smart. So the you know, all that, filter those out to the students that genuinely want to learn from the instructor. The instructors end up taking them under their wings, they end up becoming TAs, and they end up becoming professors of the, in their own right after they're encouraged to be so by that, that professor or whatever else. Same is true here. And I reg if I regret anything about RBC, it's that our college program is like, okay, that, that's all done, good luck on your own. So that was <laughs> well then good, then so some people's doing it right. What was but not here, yeah. Yes. It seems like things are structured for people into certain ages. And then yes. once you become an adult, like that's, everything is a free for all. There is no more structure. We expect you to have it all figured out. Yeah. And it's like, well, like, yeah, no, that's not how that's it not works. works. Work. Well, let me ask, the, let me end this class then, with, because I'm past, we're at our end time, with this question, and we can talk next time on whatever else. Uh, by the way, nominating topics for next time, Facebook, email, Twitter, apparently, anywhere you want to. Please let us know. Um, here, what's, what's the date of the next weekend? What's the, anybody know? 14th, 21st. Yes, okay, fine. We will not have solid ground in two weeks. We will, or, I'm sorry, I won't be here in two weeks, so continue. But uh, next week, let us know what top, let us know ahead of time what topic. If not, I'll pick one. Um, Steve, let's end on, on your point because it's a good one. Here is my question to you Do you lack knowledge? discipline, love, something that you want, then where's your discipler? If your answer is, I don't have one, then my answer to you is, that's why you lack knowledge and love and discipline. If you have knowledge, if you have wisdom and experience that would be good for other people to know, my question to you is this, where's your disciple? If you don't have one on either side, you're missing something key in the, in the model that Jesus instantiated. All right? If you're wondering why your Christian life doesn't feel like it's growing, it's because it's disconnected at two ends. You have neither a discipler, or, you know, or maybe, or you have one of the two, or you have zero of the two, nor do you have disciples. Go and do that, and you will find the, you have to be grafted into the branch. That means you're connected with those people. And the Spirit will superintend this, but at the end of the day, if you feel responsible enough, and it's, no, it's a big deal to be a discipler, then have disciples. And if you don't feel yourself responsible enough, then go get a discipler and be discipled. But that's the way, that, and that's a fancy word, but basically like, you don't know God as well as you want, go find somebody that does. If you're wondering if there are people like that, there, you can't just go down and cast a net and catch one down here in between services, but I'm telling you, there are men and women down there who are breathtakingly godly men and women. You just have to find them. And if you don't know where they are, ask some of the people around there. Ashley's connected in this church very well. And Steve, they know the people very well. They can point you in that right direction. All right, what we were supposed to do was to talk about community stuff. So I'll tell you what we will do next time. We're a little light here, so I didn't want to do it this time. But let's talk about our needs, uh, or at least categories of needs, if you don't want to share. 
uh, next time you come back in, if you have one of the needs in community here, the solid, the solid ground community, we will now call it a, community, a church community here. If you have a need, and by the way, let me give you some examples of needs. I already have given you like material examples. Hey, I don't have a social group that I'm happy with. Hey, I don't have, a disciple, I don't have disciples, and I want disciples. That's a need, right? Uh, I have, I, there's a particular set of knowledge that I want to have, and I don't have it, right? Hey, I, I am trying to do X for the kingdom, and I don't have any connections that I need in order to do X for the kingdom. All these kinds of things are needs, okay? Think marine needs, and the personal needs matter too. Think personal needs, but not just personal needs. I'm not just coming in here and saying, if you need money, tell us where. By all means, if you need money, tell us where. If you want to talk about them specifically in person, we'll, let's do that next time. Apologies for not doing it this time. But on the shelf out there, when you walk into solid ground, is a shelf that says Lost Bibles, which is a funny term, as far as I can tell. <laughs> Take your little envelope or slip of paper and just shove it in between any of those Lost Bibles. There's only like uh, you know, a dozen or two of them. I'll flip through those and pull them out. Don't put them in the leaves of the Bibles. Put them between Bibles. So I don't have to flip through them all, right? <laughs> The stick in between. It's, that is my suggestion box. It's, yeah, stick it in there or hand it to me. Um, but anytime you want, I'll, I will begin checking that before and after class each week. And that's where I'll get the ones that you don't want to say publicly. And, and do give me enough information if you want anything other than prayer about uh, wh- where to go with the solution if I have one, right? Uh, hey, I really, really need uh, you know, $500 in the next 24 hours or it's all over for me. Signed anonymous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, put anything that you don't want to talk about in group in between the lost Bibles. Okay, we'll find your request there. All right. Thank you for your time and attention. Uh, we'll do that some of that next time, but also write topics you're interested in for next time, and then we'll do the course we've been talking about starting in the fall here in I imagine mid mid August or September. Uh, God be with you this week, and as always, reach out to me if you need or want anything. And thank you all for being a part of Solid Ground. You're awesome. See you next time.